Let's go back to the phone lines and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk next to Jerry. He's listening in Lake Forest, North Carolina, WTRU. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Hank. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. I've just uh, got a question about recent discussions you've had with uh, the callers about Christian Zionism. I'm not real clear what that is and what your stance is on that. Well, my stance is uh, pretty much anti-Christian Zionism. And as I mentioned, I think it was on yesterday's broadcast, although I was probably loopy from the drugs, uh, I, I, you, I mentioned that Christian Zionism uh, is, is something that actually predates secular Zionism by about 60 years. It's a socio-political movement. It's uh, typically a movement among fundamentalist Christians that are committed to the establishment of an autonomous Jewish state in Palestine, with Jerusalem as its capital. And, and it's largely motivated by a dispensational contention that God has yet to fulfill uh, his covenant with Abraham to give ethnic Jews Eretz Israel. Eretz meaning uh, the land from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. So that's the idea behind Christian Zionism. And as I said, there's a fault line that runs through the premise. And that fault line is that God does not have distinct people. He's only always had one chosen people, one covenant community, beautifully connected by the cross and illustrated by the Apostle Paul by a cultivated olive tree. Uh, not only that, but God's promises to Abraham have been fulfilled. Not one of them has failed. Uh, this is the declaration of Joshua, uh, even on his deathbed. And certainly we see the fulfillment in terms of the land promise uh, during the height of the Solomonic kingdom. Not only that, though, a more important imperative must be recognized, and that is that Jesus fulfills all the types and shadows. So we don't long for Jerusalem only for Jews. It's Jesus that we look for. It's not the temple. It is the master teacher. It's not the land. It's the Lord. So the types and shadows find the resolution in Jesus Christ. Again, in my view, Christian Zionism, therefore, is a faulty notion. Well, how does that relate to uh, replacement theology? What's that? How, how is, there, is there some sort of correlation with replacement theology? Yeah, I, I, I think there is. I mean, now, you got to remember that replacement theology is a phrase that has been concocted to cast aspersions on those who deny this dispensational premise. Uh, so it is, in my view, designed to be an insult. But I also find it very, very ironic. And the reason is, is because the very people who wield the term as an insult believe the mistaken notion that Israel is going to replace a soon-to-be-raptured church during seven horrific years of tribulation. And ironically, those who suffer the rebuke are repulsed by the rhetoric of replacement. Why? Because there's no people to replace another people, because God only has one people. So it's not only wrong-headed, uh, it's, it's ironic. Uh, but in the sense of being uh, wrong-headed, I mean, the, the, the people labeled replacement theologians neither believe the church has replaced Israel nor the other way around. Instead, they hold that all people clothed in Christ constitute that one congruent, chosen covenant community connected, as I said, by the cross. Okay. So did you have uh, published articles about this, this topic? A couple of things. One is I've written about replacement uh, theology. You know, what is it? I've answered that question in the complete Bible answer book, collector's edition, revised and updated. Also, I've written about the whole idea, uh, the wrong-headed idea of Christian Zionism in a book called The Apocalypse Code. Okay, great. Thanks, Hank. I appreciate it. Hey, you got it. Thanks so much for your call.